Good morning and welcome to First Baptist Oakers. Our welcome and call to worship is going to come from Luke chapter 19. Luke chapter 19, we'll begin reading in verse 28. So Luke 19, verse 28. And as you're turning there in your Bibles, uh, just a couple of announcements for us this week. Next Sunday, we'll be starting our, our uh, Sunday school uh, again. And so uh, we'll have a quick announcement from David in that. I want him to just share a little bit about that. And uh, for those who are going to be teaching, we're going to have a quick meeting here uh, in the sanctuary right after service just to make sure we've got the schedule right. And we're going to have the resources to, to teach the, the kids Sunday school there. So uh, just real quick, right after service, we'll be meeting for Sunday school leaders and, and helpers. So uh, also, uh, we're going to be having our Good Friday service. And thankfully, we don't have to do it online this year. So praise the Lord for that. Uh, last year was, was interesting, wasn't it? And uh, it's going to be Good Friday. It's going to be obviously this Friday. Uh, no shocker there, hopefully, and it's going to be at 6.30 p.m. We're going to do it a little bit later, uh, just so that everybody can get here on time if they're working in Fresno or, or the surrounding areas. And so it's going to be here at 6.30 p.m., and uh, we would love to have you there with us. Also, just another quick announcement, we're going to be starting at 40 days of prayer emphasis for our church starting next Sunday. So a lot's going to be happening next Sunday. But we're going to have a, a, a devotional to pass out for everybody. So we can be playing, praying through as a church the same topic, the same theme, uh, every day for 40 days starting next week. And so we'll have those guides out in uh, the entryway next week. And so we could be praying through uh, just specifically things for our church that God would give us wisdom and, and, uh, and, and that he would increase our evangelism efforts as things begin to open up again. So I'm looking forward to doing that together as a church. Well, with that in mind, I'm going to ask David to come up. And uh, David is the, the head of our Sunday school. And David has taught Sunday school for decades. And uh, I wanted him just to share briefly, uh, real briefly, about what it has meant to him uh, being a Sunday school teacher and uh, also to encourage you to, to volunteer as well in Sunday school. So, David? Well, unlike last Sunday, I only got two minutes, so I'm going to make it quick. Um, uh, I've been teaching Sunday school for 33 years uh, since I turned 17. I'm 50 now. Uh, and uh, I got drafted into it. Um, you know, um, I didn't ask for it. And I always say a lot of times that's what happens when John calls you to do something. Um, he calls you and you answer and it's not something that necessarily I sought out but I would tell you this that participating in it uh, teaching it leading it uh, has um, brought me closer to the Lord over the years than I ever would have been if had I not done that because it pushes you uh, to get into God's Word and uh, you want you know I've always I've always had the feeling like I wanted to try to know every answer that uh, to the question that somebody might have, and so I just drive myself crazy sometimes doing that. But it is so rewarding uh, because not only what you get out of it, um, but to see the impact in, and the influence that you that God has through you uh, in the lives of others. And um, sometimes when I have done the worst or felt like I've done the worst. Is when people come up and say to me, uh, "Oh, that you know that really spoke to me. That did you know that was really good." Um, and I'm thinking, "Okay, well, that's the Lord, not me." And that's a reminder. And so I would encourage you, though, um, we need helpers. We need people that are wanting to to help out in Sunday school. A lot of times, you know, you think, "Well, I don't want to teach children and stuff." Uh, and you think, well, they're just not listening, they're not paying attention, they're just wanting to run around and do, you know, play and stuff like that. But believe it or not, it is getting into their little hearts and minds. Uh, because sometimes, sometimes later, they'll come back to their parents, their grandparents, whatever, and mention something uh, that you said or that you taught. And you're thinking, wow, okay, I, I never would have thought they were even paying attention. But anyways, I would just say, you know, uh, if God is calling you, uh, listen and respond. So I appreciate it. Thanks. Thank you, David. Yeah, so we, we are just in need of a couple more uh, uh, 
not necessarily teachers, but just assistants that kind of help with the classes. And uh, we'd like to kind of get some alternates, so it's not even a week-by-week -week commitment. But if you would uh, pray about that and think about helping us there, we would love to have you uh, help us with that. And we'll match you up with somebody who is teaching. So with that in mind, let's go ahead and let's turn our attention to God's Word. So Luke 19, verse 28, on this Palm Sunday. God's word says, And when he had said these things, he went on ahead, going up to Jerusalem. When he drew near to Bethpage and Bethany, and the mount that is called Olivet, he sent two of the disciples, saying, Go into the village in front of you, where on entering you will find a colt tied, on which no one has ever yet sat. Untie it and bring it here. If anyone asks you, Why are you untying it? You shall say this, The Lord has need of it. So those who were sent away and found, so those who were sent went away and found it, just as he had told them. And as they were untying the colt, its owner said to him, Why are you untying the colt? I said, The Lord has need of it. And they brought it to Jesus, and throwing their cloaks on the colt, they set Jesus on it. And as he rode along, they spread their cloaks on the road, and as he was drawing near, already on the way down to the Mount of Olives, the whole multitude of his disciples began to rejoice and praise God with a loud voice for all the mighty works that they had seen, saying, Blessed is the King who comes in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven and glory in the highest. And some of the Pharisees in the crowd said to him, Teacher, rebuke your disciples. He answered, I tell you, if these were silent, the very stones would cry out. Let's pray. Father, we come before you now, and Lord, we thank you, God, for this day. Lord, we thank you for this week that we have to, to just be reminded of why Jesus came to this earth. Because he is your son, your only son, whom you loved and you sent to save us from our sins. So, Lord, as we reflect upon why He came to, to suffer and die and rise from the dead, Lord, we, we pray that, that that would be at the forefront of our mind, especially this week, as we set aside this week to reflect upon the, the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. That He is our King and He is the one who brings us peace with You. So, Lord, we ask that You would be glorified and that You would be honored today in our worship, in our receiving of your word, and as we go from here. We pray all these things in Christ's name. Amen. Would you please stand and join us in singing. <laughs>
till he returns or calls me home. Here in the power of Christ, I'll share. Oh, would you turn your Bibles with me again? to Luke 19. Easter Sunday, we're going to take just a two-week break from our series in Kings uh, with the life of Elijah and Elisha, and we'll pick back up there in two weeks. So this week we are in Luke 19, so verse 41. God's Word says, And when he drew near and saw the city, he wept over it, saying, Would that you, even you, had known on this day the things that make for peace. But now they are hidden from your eyes. For the days will come upon you when your enemies will set up a barricade around you and surround you and hem you in on every side and tear you down to the ground, you and your children within you. And they will not leave one stone upon another in you because you did not know the time of your visitation. Thank you very much. You may be seated. Let's pray. Holy Father, we come before you now. And God, we thank you for your word that tells us of the peace that we can have because of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Our king, our prophet, our priest. Lord, we thank you that he came to bring us peace. May we see the peace that he has come to bring. May you open our eyes to see our need for that peace. To see that, that, that in our sin we are at odds with you. But through Jesus Christ living a perfect life, dying on the cross, rising from the dead, through faith in Him, that He did that for us, Lord, we can be at peace with You. God, we thank You and we praise You for that good news. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. What comes to your mind when you hear the word peace? Do you think of maybe an absence of wars, an absence of violence, Maybe a nice fire around Christmas time. What might it be when you hear the word peace? You know, how often we become sort of accustomed to hearing about politicians today. Talk of peace, right? We have all of these peace talks all throughout the world, especially in the Middle East, and, and, which have been almost anything but peaceful, right? Conflicts have often been sought to be relieved through peace treaties, but how often, right after those agreements are signed, another peace talk must happen, because that peace treaty has already been violated. Well, in Jesus' day, they thought that peace was going to come through great power. In Jesus' day, they thought that peace would come through great political or military power. And through this power, the, the people of Israel, they would gain freedom. They would gain freedom from their political oppressors of the, the Roman Empire. They believed that peace would come through great power. But in Luke 19, we see here the bringer of peace that we need. The, the peace that we need for all eternity. So they thought that they were getting political peace from this king here. They believed that they were getting that political peace, but that was wrong. And in the end, if they would have gotten political peace, it would have just been a temporary fix. Jesus came to bring an eternal peace, uh, a peace with, with God. Friends, because we are sinners, we're born into this world, not in a state of peace, or even a state of neutrality with God, because we are sinners, every single one of us, we are at odds with God because of our sin. Thus, we need to be made at peace with God. And the Scriptures 
constantly are calling us to be reconciled to God. We have to have our relationship with our Creator restored. And what we see here is that that will come about only through the messenger, only through the Messiah, that God Himself would send into this world, the Lord Jesus Christ. So the only way that we can be at peace with God is through Jesus, through His work of salvation on our behalf. So how can we be made right with God? We can be made right with God through the work of the Lord Jesus Christ. As you read through the Old Testament, you'll see that there are often, there's three major offices in the, the, the people of God, in, in the Old Testament. You have the, the office of the prophet, and the office of priest, and the office of king. And what's amazing about, uh, about this, this text here in Luke 19 is that you actually see Jesus fulfilling all three of those offices. The, the, the section that I read at the very beginning of, of, of our call to worship, we see Jesus acting as a king, right? Coming and riding in on, on, on a donkey. Here, we see Jesus acting as a prophet. And we'll dive into that a little bit more. If you skip on down to verse 45 and following, you see Jesus acting in, in one way in the sense of a priest. And so what's amazing, in this section of the Passion Narrative of Luke, the last week of Jesus, we see Jesus as king, as prophet, and priest. So he entered into Jerusalem acting as a king, declaring himself to be king. He's this divine, peaceful king. And so today, though, we're going to really dive into Jesus as our prophet, the true prophet, the one to whom all of the prophets point to. And so he's going to bring about this peace, but this peace will only come through great struggle and through great turmoil. So we're going to read about him. We read about him as king at the very beginning of service. Now we'll see him as prophet. In one sense, we'll see him as the weeping prophet. And what did the prophets do in the Old Testament? They would bring God's word to the people. Often that word would either be a word of judgment or it would be a word of salvation, or it would be a mixture of both judgment and salvation. So here we see Jesus acting in, in one sense like an Old Testament prophet. In one sense, kind of like the prophet Jeremiah. This prophet Jeremiah is often called the weeping prophet. I'm reading through the book of Jeremiah right now in my personal devotions, and you see him constantly weeping throughout the book. Or you have the book of Lamentations that he wrote where he's weeping over the destruction of Jerusalem, the destruction of the people of God. He was constantly weeping because he saw the sin. He saw the nation around him in sin. And he was calling them to repent, but they wouldn't. And so he's weeping because they're in sin and they're not repenting. And he knew that God was going to punish them for their sin. Thus he had numerous laments. And so here we see Jesus weeping as well. Moving at verse 41. And when he drew near and saw the city, he wept over. So as Jesus is drawing near the city of Jerusalem here, he's coming down the Mount of Olives, as he's looking out over the city. It's a beautiful sight to see if you ever make it to Jerusalem to go up on the Mount of Olives and look at the city. He's looking out over it and he weeps over it. And that word there used for weeping is incredibly strong. It's a sort of wailing, or maybe some of your translations might even say sobbing. Can you imagine that scene here? And don't miss this. Jesus is now going to rebuke them for their rejection of Him. And how does He do that? He does so with, with tears. Why is that? Why would Jesus be weeping over the coming destruction. Well, it's because God doesn't take pleasure in the death of a wicked person. As, as Ezekiel 18.23 says, Have I any pleasure in the death of the wicked, declares the Lord God. And that's what we see Jesus doing here. Friends, do you take punishment, I mean, do you take pleasure in the punishment of others? In God's judgment falling upon other people? Or do you weep with tears over the fact that there are billions of people all around the world who do not even know the Lord Jesus Christ. 
Here Jesus looks out over the city and His tears come from His foreknowledge of the city's impending destruction and rejection of Him as their only hope for eternal peace. They have refused to accept Him. And thus they have chosen to reject their only hope for peace. Jesus knows what's going to happen in that city or outside the gate of that city on that Friday. He knows that the reason He was sent was to save His people from their sins. And the only way that, that that could happen was through His perfect blood being shed on their behalf. But He also knew that meant that they would be rejecting Him. You know, every single one of us here this morning knows what it's like to see somebody you love make a foolish mistake. And, and you're pleading with them, no, don't do that. Don't, don't, don't make that decision. Don't go that route. Only for them to make that foolish decision. And in one sense, that's what's happening here. Jesus knows why He must go to Jerusalem. He knows that He must suffer and He must die and He must be rejected. And in one sense, that's why He is weeping. He knows what is awaiting those who reject Him. Those who will not repent of their sins and trust in Him. He knows the judgment that is coming upon them. And look what He says in verse 42. He says, Would that you, even you had known on this day, the things that make for peace. Would that they know the things that make for peace. But they do not. Ultimately, the peace that he's referring to here is Romans, uh, an allusion as we can say, once it's to Romans 5, verse 1. Therefore, we have been justified by faith. Because we have just been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Christ came to bring peace, but they will only reject him. Friend, do you long for that? Peace? That peace with God? The only way we can have true peace is to look to Jesus, to place our faith in, in Him. That, that He would save you from your sins. Christ came so that you would have peace, the true and eternal peace that you need with God. And so here is Jesus, the, the prophet to whom all the prophets pointed to. And he's not just a prophet. He is the prophet who brought the word of God to the people because he was God. He was the prophet who revealed God to them. God in the flesh. And he's revealing to them and all throughout his ministry how they might have peace with God, but they rejected him. And because of their rejection of Jesus, this peace is hidden from them. They, they were blind to, the, to God's terms of peace, to, to Jesus standing right in front of them. They don't respond to Jesus. And thus darkness and blindness remains. And instead of peace with God, ultimately they're going to have great turmoil and destruction. And Jesus goes on and tells them what's going to happen. And he says judgment is coming. Look at me at verse 43. For the days will come upon you when your enemies will set up a barricade around you and surround you and hem you in on every side and tear you down to the ground, you and your children within you. And they will not leave one stone upon another in you because you did not know the time of your visitation. In other words, Jesus is telling them, judgment is, is coming upon you for your rejection of God's Messiah, for your rejection of God's Savior. In the Old Testament, the word visitation, the, a visitation from God, usually would symbolize two acts. God would either visit and bring judgment, or God would, bring, would visit them and bring salvation. In, in Jeremiah 29, verse 5, uh, it says, The multitude of your foes shall be like small dust, and in an instant suddenly you will be visited by the Lord of hosts with thunder and with earthquake and with a great noise. That visitation from the Lord there in Jeremiah 29 was a visitation for judgment. Or, you look at Genesis 50, verse 24, and Joseph, he says to his brothers in Egypt, as he's about to die, he says, I'm about to die, but God will visit you and bring you up out of this land, to the land that he swore to Abraham, Isaac, 
in Jacob. That visitation of God in Genesis 50 that, that, that Joseph was alluding to there was a visitation, the great act of God for deliverance for the people of God from Egypt in the Exodus. That was a visitation for salvation. But the visitation that Jesus is speaking of here is both. He visits them, bringing salvation. And there are a couple of keys to that throughout the book of Luke for this. And in Luke chapter 1, verse 68, Zechariah says, Blessed be the Lord God of Israel, for He has visited His people and redeemed His people. Luke 7, verse 16 says, After Jesus raised the widow's son, the, the people, it said, Fear seized them all, and they glorified God and said, A great prophet has arisen among us, and God has visited His people. In other words, when Jesus is saying, you did not know the time of your salvation, the time of your visitation, He's saying they did not know their salvation. They were rejecting God's means of peace, the only way of salvation. They did not know that the true prophet, God in Jesus Christ, had come to announce His kingship and to announce His salvation. And why didn't they know this? Why does Jerusalem not know the time of their visitation, of the visitation? Well, it says, would that you, even you, had known this day the things that made for peace. And see that? They miss it because they don't realize the peace they need. They were looking for peace from something else. In other words, they were thinking in their day they needed peace from Rome. They thought they were good with God. They don't need peace with God. We're the chosen people of God. They thought they were okay with Him. But in reality, they were not. And so Jesus is coming to them as King, yet they refuse to make peace with Him on God's terms. And so they're rejecting their King. And because they have rejected Him, they will receive judgment. And Jesus tells them of the coming destruction of Jerusalem. He, he's speaking prophetically here of the siege of Jerusalem in AD 70, where Rome would come and, and they completely destroy the city. The, the Roman officer that was in charge of the siege of Jerusalem, he said that the destruction was so horrific that even he was terrified. If you know anything about Roman officers, the fact that a Roman officer was horrified over destruction, that means it was pretty bad. You can still go to Jerusalem today and see some of that destruction, some of the huge stones of the temple that were cast off. So Jesus is speaking prophetically there and saying, because you have rejected me, you have sought peace in other things, judgment is coming upon you. Friend, do you think that you are okay with the Lord God today? Do you think that God doesn't see you in your hidden sins? Are, are you looking for peace in, in, in other things, in, in political issues or, 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 or something else in your life? What other uh, areas of peace are you looking to for your hope? When in reality, the true and eternal peace we need is right in front of us in the Lord Jesus Christ so. So Jesus is saying, because you have rejected me, destruction is coming. And the destruction of Jerusalem, the rejection of the Messiah, the rejection of Jesus, shows us the costliness of sin. That judgment is coming upon sin. And if you don't turn from your sins, if you do not repent of your sin and trust in Christ, then, then your judgment, the judgment that will fall upon you and upon your sins, will be worse than even the destruction of Jerusalem itself. Because it will be hell for all eternity. So friends, don't miss out on the peace and the salvation that's available, offered to you in Jesus today. Those who reject Jesus will not see peace. Friends, Jesus came to this earth Jesus has come, and, and Luke didn't record this text here, simply to just tell us some historical predictions about the destruction of Jerusalem. No, but also to warn us, 
So that we would see that, that Jesus is, is willing to bring us peace. That He offers us peace with God. And, and, and that those who would accept Him and accept the terms of His peace, they would receive salvation. Oh, that you knew the terms of peace. And that peace comes about only through faith and trust in the Lord Jesus Christ. Through the King, the Prophet, the Priest, who has come to offer peace to us. So friends, today, may you lay down your arms. May you lay down your life, your pride, your self-righteousness, your sins, and admit that you cannot save yourself and come to know Jesus as both the Savior from your sins and your King. Friends, there's nothing greater in all the world than knowing the Lord Jesus Christ and being at peace with God. There Jesus was, heading into Jerusalem as King, coming to offer peace to a rebellious people. And as King, we'll see and we'll, we'll reflect on Good Friday, we'll reflect on how He would suffer and die for our sins on the cross. We see Him here as prophet, weeping over the people's sins, weeping over their rejection of God, calling them to trust in the one true God. And then right after this, in, in verses 45 and following, we see Him acting as priest who's able to bring us to God. And then as we'll celebrate every Sunday, right? But especially next Sunday, we'll see how He is able to rise from the dead, showing that God has accepted His perfect sacrifice. So friends, may you see Him, may you know Him, may you delight in Him as the bringer of peace, and may you share Him with others that they can be at peace with God today. Friends, as we enter into this holy week, if you will, may you reflect on the fact that Jesus is our prophet, that He is our priest, and that He is our King. And may you declare the peace that He brings for all eternity. That Jesus came to bring an eternal peace, a peace with God. Frankly, that's what we're about to celebrate right now at the Lord's Supper. We're no longer enemies. For those who have come to faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, we are no longer His enemies. We're, we're in fact invited to His table. He came to bring that eternal peace. Peace with God. We're going to enter into a time of reflecting upon what Jesus did. <clears throat> Friends, this isn't just a mere formality that we do with these cute little packets that are packaged kind of funny. Don't forget, there's a cracker in there as well. This is a reminder that, that through His blood that was shed for us, through His body that was hung on the cross for our sins, we're in fellowship with God. We have peace with God. Isn't that incredible news? This, he has extended His table to us, and we are to go and invite others to come to this table as well. I'm going to read for us from 1 Corinthians chapter 11. 1 Corinthians 11, you can go there and, and turn there with me. 1 Corinthians 11, verse 23. God's Word says, For I received from the Lord what I also deliver to you, that the Lord Jesus on the night when He was betrayed took bread, and when He had given thanks, He broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way also he took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is a new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Whoever therefore eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty concerning the body and the blood of the Lord. Let a person examine himself then, and so eat of the bread and drink of the cup. For anyone who eats and drinks without discerning the body eats and drinks judgment on himself. <clears throat> so friends, what we're about to do here is be reminded of the fact that Jesus came to bring us peace with God. And, and, and one day, He's going to come again and His peace will be fully 
and finally established here on earth for all eternity. So as we enter into this time of reflection, may we reflect upon the fact that Christ Jesus came to save sinners. This table isn't for those who are perfect, because by all means, I know you, you know me. None of us will be able to come to this table and enter into fellowship with God. This table is for those who have repented of their sins, who place their faith in Christ and have sought to follow Him faithfully. Not perfectly, but we seek to follow Him faithfully. We as a church believe that the Lord's Supper is for those who trusted in Christ and have sought to follow Him faithfully also through baptism. I know for some people that might be a, a, an interesting idea of why must you be baptized to come to the Lord's table. Well, we think that that's one of the first steps to obedience. Right? If, if Jesus has called us to obey Him, called us to follow Him, then we see that one of the first steps of obedience after faith is that we follow Him through baptism. So this table is for all those who have trusted in Christ, they've repented of their sins, and they follow Jesus faithfully through baptism. If you have more questions about that, I'll explain it uh, to, to you even further about why we believe that. But we're just trying to be faithful. We're not saying we're perfect, but we're trying to hopefully follow Jesus faithfully. So what we're going to do now is we're going to kind of, in somewhat of an orderly fashion, right? Paul wants us to do it orderly. Uh, so we'll just come up. Instead of passing these things out and having everybody touch it and passing the plates, if you just come up and grab your own and then kind of make your way back to your seat, we're all, for the most part, adults here, I think. I think we can figure it out. So if you want to make your way forward and then go back to your seat, we'll take it together. If you need it brought to you, just raise your hand. If you're unable to come up here, raise your hand. My wife was unable to come up here, so I'll bring it to you. Uh, so let's go ahead and you can come forward now and, and, and grab it. The packet has juice and a wafer in it. So. Not everybody at once. <laughs> Does anybody need it brought to them? able to, you can please stand. I'll read for us, then we'll pray, and we'll take together. There's two tabs. It's kind of hard to get. Uh, take the bread, and uh, I'll pray, and then we'll take together. Apostle Paul says that the Lord Jesus, on the night when he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Let's pray. Father, we thank you that Jesus came, he suffered, and he died on the cross so that we could be at peace with you. Thank you, and we praise you for that good news. In Jesus' name. Amen. Let's go ahead. Let's take together. Paul goes on and he says in the same way also he took the cup after supper saying this cup is a new covenant in my blood do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me for as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes Let's pray. Father we thank you for the blood of Jesus Christ that cleanses us from all sin 
And we thank you for this reminder that we have that we are to do this until Jesus returns. So we thank you for that good news that He will return again one day. In Christ's name. Amen. Let's take together. And if you would continue standing as we close in song. Thank you.